So I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. We welcome you to T.L. Elliott Ministries Bible Study. I am Archbishop Dr. Elliott. I am the teacher for this platform uh, of uh, study on this evening. And tonight, 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 uh, we begin um, chapter 7, dealing with the prophet Micah. Amen. Uh, some people say a profound prophet. I say a prolific prophet. But the prophet Micah, uh, whose name means who is like God, who can be compared to God, who who is the equivalent. It's, it's a thunderous name that speaks in the spirit to a characteristic uh, that challenges any and everyone uh, regarding who the real Lord God is. Amen. And so in that we thank the Lord for the journey that we've been on with this particular book. As those who may have assessed the book of Micah, it has a total of seven chapters in which tonight we begin the last chapter of the book. Uh, but in that, we find that this is a prophet that the Lord has not only called, but we can understand and extrapolate from the text that this is a prophet that the Lord God apparently possessed. Because as we've examined the scriptures from chapter 1 even up to chapter 6, we see that the prophet in many uh, uh, times of declaring a word is speaking in first person as if he was the Lord God himself. So we can draw the conclusion that as a human being and as a vessel that is being used by the Lord God, he's being possessed by the spirit of the Lord God in order to give truth to those who had an ear to hear. Amen. So in that on tonight, once again, we're, we're beginning with chapter seven and chapter seven, I believe is a segue from chapter six for those who were with me in the previous Bible study teachings, when we looked at chapter six, we looked at uh, the Lord God's plea unto Israel. We looked at the Lord God's plea unto a people. We looked at the Lord God's plea unto uh, a nation. And we looked at the reply of the prophet uh, regarding the plea of the Lord. We found that even in the duration of chapter one up into chapter six, we would continue to see the arrogance and the pridefulness of a people that ushers in a judgment of the Lord. And I've said this before, not only with the prophet Micah, we find that it becomes uh, trenchant among many of the periods of time that the prophets were speaking on behalf of the Lord, that the people would get into pride and arrogance and it would unlock, if I may say the cliche, Pandora's box of all of the judgments or the corrections of the Lord God in order to get them back in correct alignment. Unfortunately, though, one thing that we uh, were able to extrapolate from chapter six is even though time and time again, the people of the Lord God will receive a form of judgment from him. Apparently, they did not have spiritual ears turned on because we understand that they did not hear the rod. They experienced the rod. They experienced correction, but they didn't hear the correction. And I emphasize that right now to still convey the message that hearing, especially according to the Hebraic dialect, means more than just audible listening. It means to listen with an intent to take action. Amen. And with an intent to take action, we're hoping that each and every one is understanding that it's not just to do something, but it's to do something that is according to the spirit or the character of the Lord God. Because what is one of the most profound things that I believe the Lord God still has me in this season when it comes to teaching and preaching is to bring the spiritual understanding to the text in conjunction with the natural. Because, see, we are, as I've always said, spirits with a body, not bodies with a spirit. And as we understand that, as we continue to echo that and we continue to ingrain that within ourselves, 
we begin to have an aha moment or a revelation and an illumination that the word of the Lord God is not just meant to be read as a storybook. It's meant to be read with spiritual depth in it in order to speak and wake up your spirit man to begin to respond to what's being said within the text. That's why I believe this is still a spiritual dialogue, even in this Bible study for those who are with me to ensure that your spirit is getting a word of understanding in conjunction with what we literally read. Amen. So prayerfully, the Lord will continue to allow revelation, i.e. some things to be revealed and then illumination, meaning for the things that are being revealed to be explained or understood. So I, I, I posture uh, the, the discussion or the teaching on tonight to put you in that mindset so that as we continue to go forward with this particular writing by this particular prophet in the dispensation of time of the prophet, that it is able to uh, materialize or manifest itself as something that's speaking to each and every one of us in the now. Amen. So for those of you who are with me this evening with the text, uh, we find that um, Micah chapter seven is a very profound uh, chapter because what we are going to see is the response of the prophet based upon what has been the plea of the Lord God. It's almost like it's been volleyed back and forth for those who have Bibles that have uh, subtitles in it. You find that in chapter six, it begins with God's plea and then it comes to Micah's uh, reply. You see God's plea again and now it comes back to Micah's reply here at the beginning of chapter seven. And hopefully on tonight, we're able to get through possibly the first six verses if time permits. Because the reason I say that is because as I looked at the chapter, it's actually broken into two sections. Verses 1 through 6 deals with Micah's reply to the plea of the Lord God, or should I say, as a response to the closure of chapter 6 regarding the plea of the Lord God and how people are in wickedness, and in their wickedness, they continue to do unrighteous acts towards their own. In conjunction with that, we find that when we get to verse 7 through the end of the chapter, and the end of the chapter will be at verse 20, we see the promise of a final salvation uh, that the Lord produces for uh, his people. But let us begin to look and take a moment to uh, analyze these first a uh, few verses of chapter seven, amen. And I am reading to you from the standard King James version. And so verse one of chapter seven says, woe is me for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. So now, what we find in this particular verse is the prophet Micah, or Makkah, depending on how you enunciate his name, which once again means, who is like God? The prophet begins to make an analogy regarding um how things are when one is hungry and their hunger can't be met. Listen to what he says. He says, woe is me, meaning uh, I'm in a weary place right now. For I am as when they have gathered or collected the summer fruits or the summer harvest or the summer produce as the great gleaning or those things uh, that have been uh, set aside or enclosed by one's extent labor of working for. And he says, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desireth the first ripe fruit. So listen to what the prophet says. The prophet makes a comparison or an analogy of once again, 
one who has labored extensively in growing a harvest. But yet when they're ready to go get the harvest, there's nothing there for them to eat. Their, their expectation is totally shot because no matter how much they've done in order to make sure that the, the territory is productive or fruitful, there's nothing that's available, not even the first fruit, all right, or the earliest of fruits. Now think about this, as I mentioned here a few moments ago, especially when we go back and we assess uh, the writing of Micah, notice that I said he talks in first person in the majority of the text. So even as the prophet is speaking in a grievous state, we can also draw the conclusion that the prophet is speaking on behalf of the Lord God, even in his own illustration of nothing being available. Because the Lord God, you think about it, not only in the time of Micah, but we can even say in this dispensation or this period of time, how the Lord probably grieves within because no matter how much he's done year after year, generation after generation, decade after decade, uh, Every century after century, every thousands of years, he continues to uh, cultivate and plant seed in order for his people to be fruitful or as a harvest. And, and let me say this for those who may not even have uh, this revelation, because I've shared this in recent messages, especially as I've been ministering uh, for this entire year about the character of God. When we, when we understand what the character of the Lord God is, we can now make the correlation that his character is the fruit that needs to be produced. Amen. If that's not so, for those that go back and you read Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23, it says the fruit of the spirit, uh, and it lists characteristics. Amen. So then if we began to look at what the prophet is saying here in the natural and compare it to a spiritual analogy, we began to see that the prophet speaks on the Lord's behalf that no matter how much he sows his character in based upon his word, based upon his scripture that we're using, there is not anything being produced, not even in its infancy. There's many that are devoid of the character of the Lord God. There are many that are, are, are void of any of the fruitfulness of who he is and who he represents. And so it's causing even those who have been designated to be his separated, the ones he's designated to be his holy, the ones he's designated to be his consecrated, the ones he's designated to be his chosen, that he says, now those I've isolated or I have, have separated in order to insulate, I isolate to insulate, to make them my own, I'm finding lack in anyone being fruitful uh, within themselves that represent me so that I can enjoy consuming them within myself. This is something that I believe the prophet begins to really allude to in the spiritual context as we look here at verse 1. Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm wearied. I'm, I'm lamenting because... There is not only no harvest, like I said, even the first fruits, there is, there is no clusters. There is no, uh, watch this. The word cluster in the Hebrew is eshkol, and we can understand in the natural, it means grapes. But in the spiritual or in the metaphorical meaning, it means lovers or loved ones. There's no, there's no loved ones that I can partake of. This is what he's saying from the essence of, of the sorrow and the grief of the Lord God that the prophet is uh, implying in the words that he's speaking in this verse. Amen. So now when we move to verse two, it says the good man 
is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. What is the prophet now implying here as he's speaking from the essence of his soul and what we're believing he's here, he's conveying the spirit of the Lord God as being his spokesman. Well, here's what he says. He says, the good man is perish. Now understand this. The word good that's used here is the Hebrew word cassid. And cassid means godly. It means holy. It means faithful, and it also means beneficial. So as the scripture begins to speak from the mouth of the prophet, he says that those who are godly or those who are holy, those who have really been made sacred or separated have perished or vanished or have been destroyed out of the earth. Those who are in right standing are, are not in existence in this time. What he says is everything that has, has made individuals holy or sacred unto him in this point in time, none are existent because everything else that is unrighteous, that is, uh, 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 a uh, negative in characteristic has now become dominant that all that are holy are far and wide to be seen. So he says, the good man is perished or vanished or destroyed out of the earth. Why is that so? Other than notice that there's a colon in the verse after that one statement, which means because there is no upright among men, meaning there are no men that are operating in the character of righteousness. There's no men that are operating or desiring to be correct in their morals or ethics. There's no one that has a desire to do things the right way. Now, remember, for those who've read chapter six, you find that this becomes a city that operates in a way of slanderous or conniving business. Business practices have now tanked because they are so unrighteous that there is deception, there's cheating, uh, 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 there's Everything under the sun that's not like God that's happening as the form of business that society is operating according to. And that, that means it's the way of life. It's, it's the, the norm versus righteousness or justice being the norm. So in this, he says, there is none that are, are righteous or upright or correct or have a desire even to be right in their character, which now causes good men or holy men or, or sacred men or godly men and women to now be invisible, non-existent. What does he say about this? Well, he gives us a reason why. He says, they all lie in wait for blood. Hmm. What, what, what is the prophet really saying here? Well, he says, those who are not upright, those who are unrighteous, they have a mindset to lie and ambush other individuals. That means they have a strategy to make other people fall. It's kind of like this. We know the cliche, misery loves company. So what the prophet begins to say is uh, one of the core reasons as to why there are no men or women who have minds to be after righteousness is because they have lowered themselves to a mindset in order to deceive, uh, connive, and do whatever is necessary to entrap the innocent so that the innocent become guilty like they are. And in this, 
He says they do this by hunting them, everyone, his brother, with a net. And the net is something that symbolizes entrapment. The net symbolizes not only entrapment, but it uh, speaks to entrapment in order to doom or bring one to destruction, i.e., that lets us know that the degradation of the mindset of human beings that the prophet is speaking about is that they are so low in the way that they've operated within themselves of doing unrighteousness that they want others to operate the same way. And they will even do strategies to set entrapments so that other individuals will fall to the same way of doing business that they are. You think about it, even when it comes to business that we see in this period of time, many people are successful with business, but some people, their success is by uh, unrighteous practices. There's, there's uh, uh, tricks to the trade, as we would say. There's not much about making a decent or a fair dollar. It's just about making a dollar period. And people are always looking for shortcuts as to how to not only make another dollar, but how to make that dollar double and triple by doing whatever is a shortcut versus a righteous way of doing things. So this is the mindset that the prophet is speaking to. And I know some that are listening to me right now are probably saying, wow, we, we experienced that even in the now, regardless of how old this text was written, we still see that mindset happening today because everything that exists that has a market after it, we find that there's good business practices and there's shady business practices. And unfortunately, shady business practices are always being diverted to in order to, as we say, get ahead in the game. So this is really what the prophet is articulating for us to understand this in layman's terms. So, so in this, he says, they set a net, they set a trap, they set a snare, as the Old Testament would also call it, in order to take the head from uh, uh, the individual to keep the individual's head out of the game. Amen. So now, what are we really saying here? Let us look at verse three. In verse three, the prophet says, uh, based upon setting these nets for one's brother, he says that they may do evil with both hands. Earnestly, the prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. What's being said here now by the prophet? Well, listen to this very closely. Listen to what's really being conveyed here in this verse, especially about the character or the spirituality of individuals, because some of us could say, hmm, do I fall in this category based on what the prophet is saying thousands of years ago? This is what he said. He said, the nets are set so that they i.e. the ones who are being trapped or the ones who are being deceived or the ones who are being hunted after, that they may do evil with both hands. Now, the word evil that's being used here is reha. And reha means bad or unhappiness or wickedness but we also find that all of those things are based on worthlessness. And see, I, I emphasize that in your hearing because evil is kind of the opposite of being blessed. Why am I saying that? Well, as I said, the word evil means worthless. And when you have worthlessness about yourself, you do bad things or you do wicked things. All right. But when you look at the word bless or blessing, it means beneficial. All right. 
or or it uh, implies one that is beneficial because now it is adding worth to the individual that's being blessed or where the blessing is being directed to. So then that tells me this. Those who set the snare or set the trap for those who have the potential of living a righteous life, they set it in order to make those people who have potential to become worthless and put them in the mindset of doing wicked or evil things or put them in a mindset that they should be unhappy just like the person that set the trap. Once again, as I said before, misery loves company. And we began to find that being self-evident in the spirit. It's a spiritual thing that manifests itself over into the natural. It's just a funny thing. We can even use a cliche to express it. But what I'm showing you is the fact that it's manifested, or should I say it's rooted in the spirit because it sets with sinful thinking or unrighteous or flawed or error thinking, not only on the part of the individual who's doing unrighteous things, but it also speaks to the fact that the strategy begins to speak beyond them because they want other people to think the same way. So as we say that, what does the prophet say here once again? He says that they may do evil with both hands. Do evil with both hands. Now, some may ask, well, does that have any significance? Uh, why does it articulate both hands? Well, here's the thing. I recently did a little bit of a study out of Hebrew and Greek regarding the hands. Uh, and what we what we find that's very interesting is the right hand or not only the right hand because under Hebraic culture, when you talk about the right hand, you're talking about more than the fingers and the palm. You're talking about the entire right arm. Well, here's the thing. The right arm is the symbol of power. It's the symbol of direction. Uh, 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 it's the, 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 the symbol of everything that is associated with one's ability. Amen. But what we find is the left hand is the symbol of authority. The left hand is the symbol, believe it or not, of kingship. Uh, so, so in that, listen to what's really being conveyed then. When the prophet says that uh, they want them to do evil with both hands, it's really implying that it wants them to be worthless both in their power or ability or in their direction just as much as it wants them to be worthless in their ability or authority even in kingship or what they do in the earth that fulfills Genesis 126, being fruitful, multiplying, replenishing, subduing, having dominion. Amen. These are the things that the prophet is implying when he says both hands. So they want them to do evil with both hands, both spheres of what they are meant to be in spiritual authority and ability. Amen. And then it says not only for them to do it, do evil with both hands, but they want them to do evil with both hands earnestly. Now, I emphasize that or bring that into your hearing because the term earnestly that's being used here is yatab. And yatab means to please oneself. So, so in this, not only is a trap being set that the prophet is conveying on behalf of the Lord, he says the trap is being set to cause them to not only uh, uh, be misled and become worthless in their ability and their authority. It also is implying that they like being worthless in their ability and authority. They're pleasing themselves being pulled out of a righteous course to an unrighteous lifestyle. Isn't that something? 
to not only be pulled into an unrighteous living, but for you to be happy and want to be there. Doesn't make sense for some of us, but in the deception, listen, listen to me, in the deception of how those who are unrighteous operate, it is to entice people on a righteous path to think that an unrighteous path is better. Now, some of us are probably saying, man, I can see that right now because when we look back over our life as the song goes and we think things over, we, we can begin to look back and we can see some of the mistakes that we made, some of the mistakes we made on our own, but we will find that there's other mistakes that we made because we were influenced by others to lead us into that direction. And see, this is a spirituality that we now see. Did It just didn't rest in the time of Micah. It's something that's still happening now, which is why I'm bringing it to your attention that we have to be in a place of discernment because this is much revelation that speaks to us in the now, in the moment as believers that we have to be discerners of with a spiritual mindset. So as I say that, as I say that, let me digress and go back to verse three. What else does it say? That they may do evil with both hands earnestly. Now listen to this. Then it says, the prince asketh, the judge asketh for a reward. Now I want you to ponder that for a minute. It says the prince and the judge ask for a reward. Now I want to hit the punchline on that. What is this reward that we're talking about? Well, uh, what's, what's interesting is when you look at the word reward in the Bible, whether we're talking Old Testament or New Testament, it refers to a payment, amen? And a, a reward is mostly a due payment, i.e., just like for those that are listening to me, you have a job that you do uh, when you work for someone. And what happens is you expect a paycheck for that job. Amen. So the paycheck that you get is what the Bible would refer to as a reward. You are getting your just due for the actions that you performed. Amen. But now here's the thing. In the context of the payment here, I, I need to clarify to you what type of payment this is, uh, because this isn't uh, fair shares. This this is not a uh, payment for a day's work of labor that has been earned. The payment that's being referred to here in this particular verse is what we would call a bribe. Amen. Uh, I rub my, uh, I rub your back. You rub mine. Y'all know we, we, we kind of say, uh, uh, quid, uh, uh, quid pro quo. You know, you, you, you do something for one and they'll do it for you in return. There's something that that's being of an exchange, uh, but it's not a fair exchange. It's not something that is a legal exchange. And so what we find here is that the scripture says that uh, the prince and the judge asketh for a bribe. Now, who's the prince and the judge that's asking for a bribe? And what's, what's interesting is when we look at this very closely, uh, the Hebrew word for prince is ser, which means chief ruler or priest. And the judge, Shaphat, is a governor or a vindicator or one who is in the justice system to bring justice by bringing correction. So now listen to what's really being said. The prophet is speaking on behalf of the Lord. And what he's saying is the most profound individuals who are supposed to represent righteousness and justice 
are the main ones who seeking a bribe. He's saying that the priests, as well as the governors or those who are in the justice system are ones doing crooked work and still want to get paid for it. That's deep right there. That's deep because it begins to, to speak to us even as believers in this dispensation, as we look and we reflect upon our character, if we are the men of God, or if we are the women of God, or if we're in positions of authority, but yet we compromise the righteous character of the Lord God in order to advance ourselves and then look to get paid for being unrighteous. The text, let me divert back to the text. He said, they ask it for a reward. They ask for a bribe. It says, and the great man, he uttereth his mischief. Let, let's touch this, the great man. Who is the great man? Well, the Hebrew word for great is gadol which means the important man, all right? Whoever we have on the pedestal, the, the significant people of the room, the, the, the most important, the most intent, the, uh, the most known, the, the most uh, to have notoriety. It says these individuals even have arrogance that they make their mischief desires known or mischievous. They utter them. That means they speak and not only speak them, but they declare them. And, and what do I mean by declare? Other than the fact that they not only speak it, but they recite it. They practice it. They echo it. It continues to be something that's regimental that comes out of their mouth so that it can manifest itself. And in the manifestation of itself, keep in mind, we're talking about great people that speak uh, ungodly mischief. They speak misleading people. They speak destroying people. These are their desires. These are their lusts within themselves. This is the characteristic that the Lord God is calling out through the prophet Micah. And now, right now, right now, we can even call it out even in this dispensation because some can probably look to the left and to the right and begin to say, man, I know some people that already fall into that category. This is very profound that the prophet was talking about something thousands of years ago that history continues to repeat itself with unrighteous people because they continue to fall into the trend of being in the same character and they still have the same tendencies that even though they're in unrighteous character, they're setting traps for other people to fall into the same category of the way that they operate. Now, what else is interesting is what the prophet says at the end of this verse. He says, so they wrap it up. What, what, what are we saying here? Now, I'm not talking about a Christmas gift. I'm not talking about a birthday present wrapping something up like that. The, the, what, what is being conveyed here is the Hebrew word abath, which means to weave it together. Listen, listen what, what, what he's saying. He's saying that the traps that are being set for individuals who have potential to live righteous lives is being woven into the strategy of pulling them out of course in a righteous lifestyle to an unrighteous one, a worthless one. And what's being weaved into the midst of that strategy is for bribery to occur to kind of uh, supplement the trickery or deception. And in the same turn, technically speaking things into existence. Now, now in this, let, let me even touch this because 
it's as we speak things, we as kingdom people have the ability to speak things into existence according to the will of the Lord. But when we're falling out of the will of the Lord and we're speaking and we're reciting things, could it be that we're hinging on witchcraft? We're hinging on sor sorcery. And the reason I say that is because witchcraft and sorcery hovers in the arena of what's called mind manipulation. Mind manipulation is about deception. It's about manipulating a mind to do what you want it to do. And in that, when any man or woman manipulates the minds of others to do what they want them to do, then that means God is not in the picture. The Lord God is not in the place of their influence of direction of what they decide to do because the individual now is under the influence of the person who has manipulated them with the way that they've said things and the things that they've done to them and, and how they operate around them in order for them to be deceived and think that the false is true and the truth is false. This is what this is this is what 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 is happening as the prophet says they weave things together. What else does the prophet say? Let me go to the next verse, verse 4. It says the best of them is as a briar, the most upright is sharper than a thorn edge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. So what does the prophet give us here as the prophet continues to reply on the Lord God's plea to the people? Well, what he says is basically out of verse three, the ones who are deceiving, setting traps, the ones that are declaring things, the ones that are asking for bribes, he says the best or the most valuable out of them is as a briar, is as a thorn, is as a pain. It's not, it's, it's not something em, embraced that's brought a person to ease. They become the pain of the thorn in a person's side. They become the agitator. They become uh, what causes things to be chaotic. They begin to become what causes things to be out of order and disjointed. He says, this is the best of them. And in that, the most upright, the most correct, or the most straight out of them is even sharper than a thorn hedge. So he, basically what he says not only are they far from godliness, even though they may be motivational speakers, not only is he saying they far from godliness, no matter if they do empower you for positivity of things of the world, he says they're still sharp and they're still cutting. They're still destroying. They're still breaking you away and severing individuals who have the potential for the righteousness of the Lord God. This is the kind of trickery and deception and mind manipulation that the prophet was talking about in this period of time of the text. And he's really saying this spirituality still exists, which is why we can believe it's still in the record of the word of the Lord God. God. Sharper than thorn hedge. So then he says, there's coal in there. Based upon this, what he says, based upon this, he says, the day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. What are we saying here? Well, we believe that the prophet is saying there's a period of time. We talk about day, the yom, uh, which can be 24 hours in a day. But we're talking about a period of time when we analyze the structure of the text. He says there's a period of time that thy watchman or the one who is set to observe you. There's a time that's coming of observance that is to occur. And in thy observance, 
There is thy visitation. There is thy encounter. There is thy oversight of care. Because the visitation that the Lord does is an encounter that an individual has based upon the care of the individual or the oversight or the overlooking of the individual. So he says, there's a time that individuals will be in observance and there will be a time that comes that there is a visitation. Now we can look at the visitation here because Christ Jesus made a visitation later, as we know, than the writings of Mike in the New Testament. He made a visitation upon man because man was in such a sinful state of mindset that Christ had to come and give a visitation unto us based upon the care and the nurturing and the reset of mankind. But he cometh. And what's interesting, he says, now shall be your perplexity. Now shall be your confusion. Because you won't know what's really going on and who's on the scene. Y'all, y'all know we, we, we even experience that now in this period of time because the Lord God sends many messengers, many angels, many men of God and women of God. But based upon where we are in our mindset, if we're not looking to get ourselves corrected, we're in a place of complexity. We're in a place of perplexity. We're in a place of confusion, just like what the prophet was saying here to speak to what was to come. Because even when Jesus came, when we look at the New Testament, we look at the Gospels, he spoke profound through Micah by saying that they were perplexed because, watch this, it was the priest of the Sanhedrin who were taking deals or taking bribes. It was the government or the governing system that was in place that was still taking bribes. We, we, we find what's really being said here was something that manifested itself 2,000 years ago in the record of time when we really analyze the text and we see that that mindset is still active even today. So what, what does the prophet say here in verse five? He says, trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the door of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. So the prophet says here, he says, don't put your support or your faith, your passing in your conviction in a friend. Because a friend, according to scriptures, is just a companion. The Hebrew word is reya. And what, what, we, what we can find, especially in Jesus' interpretation of a friend, is really one uh, who's only meant to help you fulfill the Father's will in the earth. All right? But yet, he says, don't put your faith in these other external sources. He says, put ye not confidence or trust or hope in a guide. And what is a guide other than what is known as a familiar person who governs? One, one you may be acquainted with, but you don't have an investment with. So it says, don't, 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 don't put your, your hope in, and your trust in someone who seems to represent a uh, a governing system or that you are familiar with. What does he say? He says, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom or guard your mouth or exercise guarding your mouth from allowing it to open the door of being a liar within the midst of thyself. Because see, once again, what is the luring factor that we see that the prophet brings to our attention about those who are evil 
other than by lying and deceiving individuals with the words of their mouth in order to get them to compromise or sacrifice having the potential of righteousness in order to be diverted to an unrighteous lifestyle to join the unrighteous. So he says in this, based upon what I'm bringing to your attention, guard your mouth that you don't find yourself getting sucked in into the ways of the unrighteous, that now it becomes something that you not only speak, but it comes into you and it becomes something that's in the midst of you that is continually being birthed out of you, that now this has now become interwoven in who you are as an individual. This is what I believe the prophet Micah brings to our attention. If I may touch this last verse, amen. If I may touch this last verse, verse six, it says, for the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and man's enemies are the men of his own house. Because what he's saying here in, in a nutshell, these things are what divide a household. These things are what divide an individual, uh, whether from family, friend, loved ones, etc. It's all about what you say and how it's being conveyed that now cause the division or the separation. This is what causes foolishness or ungodliness to come into the lifestyle of individuals because there are some that are sons to fathers. And, and understand this, when I say sons to fathers, uh, the word son in Hebrew means name builder or character builder. What is a character builder other than one who is building the character of their father within themselves? And one that builds the character of their father within themselves is meant to be one that sustains the character of the father beyond the father. And so in that, this is why I believe the prophet makes the analogy. He says, sons dishonor their father. They don't value the character of their father because now they've gotten into self. They've become selfish and now they're operating in their own character and their own deceptiveness to cause them now to break away from honor to being uh, dishonorable among their fathers. It says daughters are are the same. They began to rise up or to rebel against the mother who is the bond of the family, the connection of the family. One who brings things together in order to have the proper time of departure. So we began to see this coming forth out of the character of deceptiveness that the prophet is speaking about here in the first few verses of the chapter. And see what that does is it causes individuals to become enemies. It causes individuals now to be on two different sheets of music. If I can use that example where they now can't fulfill Amos chapter three for Amos three says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? There now no longer is agreement. There now no longer is covenant. There now no longer is honor or value. There now no longer is honorable words being spoken out of the mouth of those who are meant to be connected because now the trap has been set and it's caused many to go astray. So in that, I hope this is a word that ministers to somebody on tonight, not just looking at the history record of what the prophet stated here in Micah chapter seven, but also being able to assess and discern this through spiritual eyes as to how it impacts each and every one of us, even now on a day to day basis, that we should forever be careful in keeping our guard up, that we're not deceived, we're not uh uh, uh, fooled, we're, we're not uh, 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 hoodwinked or bamboozled to get off course from the righteousness or the character of the Lord God, where he says, now I can't even see myself within you. Amen. 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 I just pray this has been a word of teaching 
for each and every one to understand and assess for themselves on tonight.